Africa and the Middle East, Terrorist Threats. Our presenter today is Robert Gerace, an adjunct professor here at RIT. Bob has been with RIT for 32 years and has taught nine different courses in three different colleges, including a course on Encounterterrorism for 10 years. Bob spent 27 years as a Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer, including 10 years as Acting Naval Attaché to the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria. Unit assignments for all 27 years were in support of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Bob holds a master's degree in national defense and strategic decision making from the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Bob recently retired from Paychex, where he was a senior leadership and management trainer. Thank you for joining us today, Bob. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be a part of this. Are we set? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this presentation. We're going to be talking about something which I think is a significant geopolitical threat uh, impacting United States foreign policy. So you've heard about my background, you've uh, seen some of the experiences I've had. I've lived in Africa for a year in my uh, past career, so this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. As far as what we're going to try to accomplish today, I'd like to try and give you a, an overview, a high-level overview of the geopolitical environment in northern and sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and it's going to spill over into the Middle East. We're also going to touch on something which I think is a very interesting concept having to do with failed states and also corrupt states. And to try to draw a correlation between what's going on in some of these failing countries and the impact on growing terrorism threats. I'd also like to provoke uh, your discussion, your questions, your comments, your experiences about terrorism being the weapon of choice going into the future. So let's start out with something called asymmetric warfare. Uh, back in the early 1940s with the Geneva Convention, there was a, a development of a protocol among nation states. And when there is some kind of a problem or conflict between two nation states or two countries, they would respond through ambassadors, through envoys, uh, and so forth. There's a means of ratcheting this up and also ratcheting it down in terms of conflict. I'd also like you to be aware of something called a cost versus impact grid. What we have is just a very simple four-box grid with cost, high cost, and low cost, and the impact being high impact or low impact. When you take a look at terrorism, and I want to re reference that previous slide we just talked about uh, as being the weapon of choice, terrorism is very low cost with very high impact. So let me just touch upon that for just a second. Uh, the cost of making a backpack or a briefcase bomb is incredibly low. You can go to a store, a hardware store like Home Depot, and purchase the nuts and bolts and ball bearings and so forth, and all the other ingredients for about $85. And with a, a piece of C4 explosive about the size of a pack of cigarettes, it's sufficient to blow up buses, trucks, cars, and so forth. So low cost, high impact. Let's couple the asymmetric warfare now with this other concept called the spectrum of conflict. There is a ratcheting up and also a ratcheting down. And if you take a look over on the, on the graphic where it says peacetime presence, uh, nothing is going wrong. Until there is some kind of a, a, a small or low-key invasion or some type of an incursion at a border, and then you get into a series of steps or protocols, including surveillance and a show of force, and then possibly a preemptive strike followed by a reactive strike, and then the temperature starts to get hotter. It leads to a low-intensity con uh, conventional war, medium-intensity conventional war, and so forth, until we finally get into the realm of thermonuclear war. And I think we're seeing in a number of areas of Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, and so forth, getting into low and medium-level uh, uh, conventional warfare. Okay, we talked about failed states and corrupt states. Uh, there were actually some international organizations studying this thing called a failed state, and they have come up with three different categories. You see them, they're social, economic, and political, and within those there are 12 different factors that are actually measured. They're quantified, it's a, it's a metric to determine to what degree a state is failed. Let me draw your attention to the first category, which is social, and category number five of slum creation, which is destabilizing easily 10 countries in uh, 
West Africa, East Africa, and the Middle East. The fact that we have some terrorist activities going on in those countries is uh, creating an emigration of people across lines into uh, the barest and the most frugal refugee camps, which is creating tremendous human suffering as well as financial uh, crises for those countries. So what countries are we going to talk about as far as failed states? Within the top 20 out of close to 200 countries, we've got Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan, Kenya, Nigeria, and the other countries in the right-hand column, Syria, we've all known of over 200,000 people who have been slaughtered in that country, our in, in, um, inclusion in the uh, war in Iraq and Pakistan. So these are within the top 20 failed countries. Now let's take this one step further and try to see the impact of corruption on some of the countries. If you take a look at my comment on the right-hand side of that slide, the lower the score, the more corrupt the country is. So if you take a look at the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, which broke off from Ethiopia a number of years ago, they're on the list, and Libya and Iraq, uh, South Sudan, Sudan, uh, Somalia being the most corrupt of all. Now what I'd like you to do is take a look at that list and say to yourself, where does the United States or where has the United States try to do something to foster democracy, to assist in the Arab Spring, and that takes us back to Libya, to Iraq, to Somalia, and so forth. So we see a correlation now between corrupt states and failed states and where some of the problem countries um, exist. If you're wondering at all about my interest in terrorism, this is what is left of a car bomb explosion that happened outside of my office in Lusaka, Zambia in 1973. I was on the second floor in the government office building there. When I was literally knocked out of my chair, I was unconscious for what might have been one or two minutes. And when I finally gained consciousness and made my way through the shattered picture frames and the shattered windows, I looked outside and this is what was left of a terrorist um, act by some white supremacists from white mercenaries from southern Rhodesia who had targeted a person from India who was working for the Ministry of Culture. And this individual was writing about the glory of the independence of Zambia. And they sent him a registered letter or a registered box. And as we all know, you have to go into the post office and sign for it. And he took this box back out to the car and opened it up. And it was a paperback book. And what was inside the paperback book he took it out of the box, he went to flip through it or to finger through it, and it had a, um, a significant amount of C4 explosive and a triggering device, and this is what was left. I won't describe what happened to him, his wife, and his two children. Now, when we talk about low-cost, high-impact explosions and C4 explosive and things like that, in addition to the impact of the shrapnel, and let me just call time out for a second, you may remember what happened in the Boston Marathon bombing. It was not only the shrapnel which created significant damage to a number of participants and runners and spectators and so forth, but there's also an amount of damage which is done from the overpressure of an explosion. Let me draw your attention about halfway down to where it says 35 pounds per square inch. This is the threshold of fatalities. And to give you a sort of a relevance to that number, for those of you with automobiles or bicycles, the tire pressure there is usually between 32 and 34 pounds per square inch. So in fact, it's possible to overinflate one of those tires and find that it, it explodes and you're on the threshold of certain fatalities. But with an explosive like the things that we're seeing in terrorist activities, it's up around 50% fatalities, 99% fatalities within about a 20 yard range. All right, let's try to draw this into a political environment to try to figure out what's at stake for the United States. Where are our strategic interests or are there any strategic interests? So let me start with talking about the national military policy. And the sentence there is pretty much self-explanatory. It's to protect our freedom and to protect our economy and our way of life. The key phrase here is while keeping the sea lanes of communication open. It's interesting to think of the United States as an island nation, and we are. With the Atlantic and the Pacific on either side, we are in fact isolated from the rest of the uh, continents around the United States. 
So part of this national military strategy is also to maintain some kind of regional stability and the balance of power. So even though we have acknowledged that we have supported some dictators for decades in certain countries like Egypt, it has created a situation of stability and a balance of power, a hegemony, so that no one country overpowers the entire region. So how do we do that? How does the United States military policy do that? There are three uh, parts to this puzzle. First of all, we have something called a, for a forward deployment. And the numbers I've got there represent the number of active deployed ships that we have around the world right now, 295, out of approximately 271 total battle force ships. If you're looking for a relevance for that number, we used to have a 600-ship Navy under the Reagan administration that has uh, consistently and steadily eroded to the number that we've got right now of about 271 deployable ships. The second way we accomplish this is by pre-positioning troops and logistical support. So if you're wondering about the scores and scores of bases we have in Okinawa, Hawaii, Europe, and so forth, it is to pre-position our troops there and to have munitions and supplies and food and so forth necessary to support a rapid response, which is our third thing a rapid response with overwhelming force. So I'd like you to just keep that thought in mind as you think about what's going on with the battle with ISIS at the present time in Syria and Iraq and other parts of uh, Northern Africa and our reluctance to respond with overwhelming force. Now here's an interesting thing. It's called the Aspen Doctrine. Some of you may recall the name Les Aspen. He was a congressman under the first administration of Bill Clinton, and he was made the Secretary of Defense. And let's uh, wind the clock back to 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev. What we found is that the Soviet Union could no longer support the proxy war in Angola and in Mozambique. They were supplying funds and weapons and so forth to the Cuban troops who were fighting in those two countries. Proxy war, proxy war, that's an interesting phrase. It was really a war between the Soviet Union and the United States using other countries. So what was found when they had to withdraw the funding of the Cuban troops and they were repatriated to Cuba, over 15,000 of these Cuban soldiers came back home HIV positive. Uh, this would have been a health disaster and crisis in Cuba, so Castro made the decision to quarantine these 15,000 or so people in a fenced-in compound. As a result, as a result, there's something called the Aspen Doctrine, was supported by the Clinton administration, whereby no U.S. troops would ever be on the ground in Africa. We would provide humanitarian support. We would provide logistical support food and medical supplies and so forth, but no troops on the ground. I'm raising a rhetorical question at the bottom of this particular slide. What decision did President Obama make in October of 2011? And he did in fact send something like 320 special forces to East Africa, initially in Kenya and Tanzania, and eventually over toward the Congo to try to track the whereabouts of a significant um, killer by the name of Joseph Kony, who was known for raping, pillaging, uh, burning villages, and taking young boys and turning them into radicalized soldiers. So what are the hot spots? Um, where are we focusing our attention in terms of either the development or the lack of a foreign policy toward Africa? We got a lot of choices here. We've got 13 up on the screen right here. If you take a look at Africa, we've got a number of countries that you can see right there on your computer screens. And very close by in the Middle East, we've got Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. So a total of 14, what I would 13, what I would consider to be hotspots drawing United States resources in some cases and also usurping our foreign policy position. So take a look at this map. You can see the dark shaded areas where these failed states exist, and the failed states have left power vacuums. I think that's another key term here, the power vacuums, which in some cases where the United States had been present, we have vacated those countries like Libya, uh, 
um, and uh, Yemen. We have um, uh, left those areas only to leave a power vacuum that has been filled by at least one or more of 10 different terrorist organizations. So let's go through each of these countries. I'd like to talk about the country. I'd like to talk about <coughs> some of the geopolitical ramifications in those countries. And then we'll talk about which terrorist groups are creating the instability um, in the balance of power there. So the first one, as we take a look at Central Africa, is Mali. It borders a country called Niger. So what's the significance there? If I could draw your attention just a little bit north of uh, Niger, we have Chad. You may remember in the early 1980s, Libya, under Muammar Gaddafi, invaded Chad. There was nothing there. Chad has a lot of sand and not a lot more than that. So why invade a country like Chad? Well, if you can destabilize Chad and destabilize Niger, right south of Niger is Nigeria, one of the most populous countries in West Africa and also one of the wealthiest in terms of their oil deposits. We're going to talk about Niger a little, excuse me, Nigeria a little bit later, but destabilizing Nigeria, one of our uh, strongest allies, would have significant economic and geopolitical ramifications. We'll talk about that later. Okay. So there was a um, terrorist organization, the Movement of Oneness and Jihad. It was driven out by the French and the Malian troops in 2013. So things there at least recently have been somewhat quiet, although there is a situation of 200 to 300 child soldiers taken, radicalized, never to be repatriated with their families again. Let's move to the east, to Libya. You see that Muammar Gaddafi's picture has been uh, crossed out. He has been replaced by General Haftar, but we have two competing governments, one a terrorist organization, the other one is a legitimate government. But there is, in fact, really chaos and civil war going on in Libya. There's no real functioning government. You may remember approximately two years ago when the uh, cabinet resigned, we saw the Benghazi incident where there was actually an attack on the American consular office. And although it was originally described as a, a protest gone bad, we find now that it was really sponsored by a terrorist organization that all of you have heard of, Al-Qaeda. Okay, we thought this would be a successful move toward democracy with the Arab Spring following what we saw in Tunisia. But what we're now seeing is that this could be <clears throat> one more step toward the creation of an Islamic caliphate with strict Sharia law superseding democratic law or constitutional law. Libya is a big oil producer. Right now, much of that oil is going to the terrorist organization to fund their operations. And what we have is instability in northern Africa, in Libya, which is right on the Mediterranean Sea, which is where the United States has a significant naval presence in order to maintain or try to maintain regional stability. This is one more case of a power vacuum that we tried to democratize, and it turned out to be uh, something that blew up on our faces. Egypt, we're moving a little further to the east, also bordering on the Mediterranean. You see the picture of, of uh, Hamad Karsi? No, I'm sorry. Former president, of, his name just escaped me. And Mohamed Morsi, two of the presidents who have been deposed. We now have President al-Sisi in power, but another situation of a possibility of an Arab Spring turning to democracy. Uh, president was overthrown. And what we've seen with Egypt, in the 1970s, they were an ally of the Soviet Union. They have since swung over to become part of um, the United States alliance, but there still is a significant presence of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is their military arm a terrorist organization dating back probably 70 years. You know, an interesting thing, if you take a look at that third bulleted item that says human, that stands for human intelligence. And that was the community that I was connected with for 27 years in the Naval Reserve Intelligence Program. These are the people who are on the street collecting and processing intelligence. And one of the difficult things we're seeing right now, especially during the Clinton administration, when he significantly downsized the human and intelligence communities, is now we have a difficult time figuring out who are the emerging political leaders and the military leaders. 
So this is the second of the series of Arab Spring uprisings. We also see now there's another power vacuum, which is destabilizing the area and creating a significant amount of instability in Israel in terms of what's going to happen with uh, possible terrorist activities across their border. Yemen. Yemen, as you saw, was one of the highest ranked failed states and one of the most corrupt governments. It sits not in Africa, but on the tip of the Arabian Peninsula. But the picture to the right shows you what had occurred with a little rubber boat that came up to the USS Cole. You may remember the killing of 17 American sailors and significant damage as a result. This now has significant strategic value in that it's right at the entrance to the Red Sea leading to Israel and to the Gulf of Aden, which is a significant shipping lane. We talked about the sea lanes of communication. Ranked number eighth as a failed state. One of the things that Yemen has been very good at is kidnapping foreign tourists. For a period of time, not recently, but for a period of time, perhaps five, six, seven years ago, some people actually thought it was a game to go to Yemen and get captured and get uh, rescued through some kind of um, ransom that was paid and have something significant to talk about. Now that's a very deadly thing to even flirt with. We're finding that this is the next jihadi stronghold. The AQAP stands for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a significant destabilizing factor there. So we have something very interesting going on. As far as the chaos in Yemen is concerned, this is another one of those proxy wars, this time between Iran and the United States. And Iran has Qatar as one supporting um, actor in this. The United States has Saudi Arabia. What we see going on in Yemen is the Houthis, uh, a tribal group of Shiite Muslims. They have been successful in overthrowing the legitimate government, which was partial and supportive of the United States. Uh, and the rebel leader wants a greater share of power. Whenever we hear about a greater share of power, especially from a tribal faction, you might also want to consider track the money. Where is the oil and where is the money? What we also find in Yemen is a sect or a branch of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula responsible for the underwear bombing. If you remember that from the uh, Delta Airlines that was flying to Detroit 2009, uh, printer cartridges that were loaded aboard another aircraft and also the very recent attack in Paris. Let's go a little bit to the south, to the Horn of Africa, to Somalia. What you see in that picture is another little rubber boat. Sometimes they're also called Zodiac boats. They're high-speed boats, and what they have been very good at is coming up to freighters and merchant ships with nothing more than AK-47 rifles, automatic rifles, and R, uh, rocket-propelled grenades, RPGs. They've been successful in taking the command of these ships, holding them for ransom, and finding that the insurance companies are more than happy to pay several millions of dollars to get the ship back, but in fact they are uh, financing uh, continued terrorism. At least for the time being, we haven't seen that much of the hijackings uh, by Somalia uh, because of the increased pressure of uh, UN shipping uh, ships and uh, American warships as well. In Somalia, we have another terrorist organization. It's an affiliate of Al-Qaeda, at the bottom of the screen you see Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab has been uh, very recently linked with the attacks in the Westgate Mall in Kenya and also the uh, attack on a university in Kenya as well. Sudan. Sudan has gone through a tragic civil war between the northern faction and the southern faction, uh, one of the most corrupt and failed states as well. As you see, they rank number one and number five as failed states. The government has allowed certain militias called the Janjaweed. Uh, you see the translation there, devils on horseback. Some of them come on horseback. Some of them come in nothing more than pickup trucks with their AK-47s and machetes. But take a look at the number of people who have been displaced. It is millions of people who have gone across borders to nothing more than other refugee camps creating a United Nations crisis. Over 200,000 people killed here. One of the things that is, 
has been seen in Sudan is the use of rape as a terror weapon. When you have two uh, competing tribes, one very effective technique is to rape the women in the other tribe and force them to have the, the children um, of the opposing tribe. It becomes a matter of sexual violence, but it's something with growing uh, international awareness. Kenya and Tanzania, it's almost like we're going around the clock here. We're now in East Africa. I've been to both of these countries. What you have is a picture of one of the American embassies after the bombing several years ago, uh, killing uh, mostly uh, locals in both of those countries. Uh, hundreds of people were killed in this attack. Current President Uhuru Kenyatta, 18th failed state. You know, it's kind of interesting when I visited Nairobi, Kenya, it was almost like being in, Ni in Miami Beach. Uh, very similar in terms of the commercial area, tall buildings, very successful economy there. But it has turned into a failed state uh, because of the instability from Rwanda, Burundi, from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Tanzania also, we saw a, an interesting thing occur with um, Tanzania with the bombing of the embassy. And take a look at the second last bulleted item there. A number of years ago, there was the leftover shoulder-launched missile casing in an attempt to shoot down an El Al, or Israeli, transporter jet. So this becomes one more consideration in terms of terrorist threats. If you're thinking about shoulder-launched missiles, you might want to just Google that particular thing and find out where they might be available on, on the black market. In some cases, as inexpensive as $1,000 up to more sophisticated models, of 25 to maybe $50,000, but they're out there readily available. And we've already mentioned the Al-Shabaab attacks on the university and the Westgate Mall. Let's move inland now to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Number four is a failed state. For some of you, may you may recognize some of the different names in that country, for that country, from the Con Free, uh, Congo Free State, the Belgian Congo, et cetera, et cetera. The United States used to have a very strong relationship with their dictator, Mobutu Sese Siku. He eventually died of prostate cancer a number of years ago and was replaced by what turned out to be uh, a dictator and an autocrat, Laurent Kabila. He was assassinated. He has been replaced by his brother, Joseph, and since then by a new president. What we have here is an example of some tribal rivalries that go back centuries rivalry between the Hutus and the Tutsis. And periodically, about every five or 10 years, there is a massacre, there's a slaughter between the two tribal factions. But one of the interesting things about the Congo, and it being a failed state, and it being corrupt, is to take a look at the second last bullet item on this slide, the genocide. Over a million people were slaughtered approximately within the last 10 years, within the Clinton administration, and the United States and the international community did virtually nothing until later on they finally acknowledged they could have, they should have done something. Uh, they apologized, but after that, uh, the damage had already been done. So let me take you back to the Aspen Doctrine of not having UN or US troops on the ground. Nigeria. I've had two duty assignments at the US Embassy in Nigeria. Most populous uh, country in the entire African continent, you see a crossed out picture of good luck Jonathan. He was just upset in an election approximately two or three months ago. They rank 17, number 17 is a failed state. And what we're seeing in the northern part of Nigeria, where basically the Hausa and Fulani tribes are, is that the, there is a development over the last three or four years of Boko Haram. It's an extremist Muslim group. They are creating acts of savagery, not only in northern Nigeria, against Christians, but they're also going across the border to some of the neighboring countries. And it's kind of interesting, when you take a look at Nigeria, uh, they've had conflict for quite a long time on a tribal and religious basis. If you take a look at the third bulleted item, the Hausa and Fulani are in the north, they're Muslim. In the south, you have the Igbo and the Yoruba. The question arises, where is the oil? The oil is down in the south. It's along the shoreline going from Lagos east to Port Harcourt. 
So the Hausen Fulani, through several military coups over the last 20 years, have <clears throat> taken control of the government, taken control of the oil. But do you all remember back in the 1960s, there was a horrible civil war killing roughly two to three million people. It was called the Biafran War. Let's move forward. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of wealth in Nigeria at the present time in the form of its oil. It is recognized by Economist magazine as being one of the next 11 economies to develop over the upcoming 10 years. But it's also known as a kleptocracy, uh, a government by stealing. And it's really interesting how much bribery there is within that culture that is just simply uh, a part of the way they do business. Uh, example, when I arrived for my first duty assignment in 1989, I was met by an expediter who was sent by the U.S. Embassy. We had to bribe nine different people just to get out of the airport. Some of them just had card tables and some kind of a phony uniform, but you couldn't get past them unless you passed them a few naira, which is their local currency. So we've got a new president, Muhammuda Buhari, also a president who has been elected as a civilian, but he has been responsible for the Army in past administrations. Let's go one bulleted item below that. Nigeria is an ally of the United States. They have the strongest military in the region, which doesn't really say much, but their navy is called a brown water navy. How do we differentiate that? What does that mean? Well, the United States, China, Russia have blue water navies that we sail across the oceans. The Nigerians don't have the capability to maintain or to own ships. So they stay pretty close to the shore. They have one frigate which was purchased from the United States. The rest of their ships are either tugboats or Zodiac boats, most of which are in ill repair and stacked up um, at the naval bases. But they have been a significant force with their ground troops. They support the United States. They support the United Nations and also the African Union for regional stability. Let's go back one more time to the Aspen Doctrine the United States, many of the, the European countries do not want to put boots on the ground there. So for the uprising that we have seen in the Ivory Coast, the recent conflict in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, also the other side of the African continent, continent in Darfur, we have supported the use of Nigerian troops through money, through ammunition, through weapons, and so forth. Nigeria plays a very significant role in something called ECOWAS and ECOMOG. They are the focal point, they are the, the hub, and the other countries around them are spokes. It's something called the Economic Community of West African States. That is the Federation of, of Commerce of, uh, of Economic Development there. The ECOMOG is the military side of that. It is the Economic Community, of Monitor, Economic Community Monitoring Group. So they're the ones that will mobilize the troops from various African countries taking the lead and uh, creating stability or, or reducing the amount of civil war damage in the countries that we've just mentioned. What I'd like you all to be aware of also <clears throat> is despite our alliance um, of Nigeria, or with Nigeria, there's something called the Nigerian Connection. And this came to light around the mid-1980s <clears throat> Uh, through something called the Golden Crescent. Now, many of you have already heard of the Golden Triangle, which is Burma and Laos and Thailand. Now, the Golden Crescent is three other countries uh, identified for the uh, exporting of opium. So what do they do with it? The countries involved are Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iran. And what they do with the opium and with the heroin is to ship that over to Nigeria. You may have heard the term mules before. Uh, people in various villages are coerced or forced under threats of violence to them or their families or their tribes to swallow little rubber packets of um, heroin. And then they'll get on an airplane and fly to one of three airports, either JFK, Baltimore, Washington Airport, or Dulles Airport. And it's interesting, in one of my duty assignments there in 1993, um, I was curious as to why in the morning on the way to work there might be three people lined up at the door of the Australian Embassy. 
and maybe six people at the door of the German embassy, et cetera, et cetera, just a small group of people seeking visas. The United States embassy, uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning, there might be somewhere between 200 and 500 people lined up. And it was somebody from the consular office who just sort of smiled and winked his eye, and he said, they're all going shopping in the United States. Well, I did have an opportunity on my return trip from that, um, that uh, brief tour to sit next to one of these mules. And obviously, there's no sign on his on his sport coat, but here's a man literally dressed in tatters. His shoes were falling apart. One could best say that he was dressed in rags, and we were in the last row of the airplane, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to America. And I said, whereabouts? And he said, Washington, D.C. I said, what are you gonna do there? And he said, I'm going shopping. So I had a feeling I was sitting next to one of those individuals who's about to deliver um, a little container of opium, heroin. West Africa. West Africa has seen its civil war and tribal wars over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, although these things are now somewhat um, subdued, we have to take a look at what has happened with um, the regional stability or lack thereof, the civil war and the genocide, which has created a refugee countries, uh, refugee crisis in other countries, literally with tens of thousands of people. Bottom of the screen, you can see that the use of Ecomog Nigeria comes into play here. Okay, so we talked about the background. We've talked about the hotspots. Let's talk about a term that has maybe come become a very popular term within the last 10 years. It's called franchise terrorism. We've got a bunch of players here. You know, it's interesting to think that when we thought we got Osama bin Laden, that that would cut off the head of the snake and that terrorism would come to an end. And it hasn't. Other people have stepped up, number one. And number two, there are franchises or leaderless terrorist groups that have developed in a number of other countries. Up on your screens, you've got at least 10 different terrorist organizations, 10 different organizations operating autonomously, some of them pledging their uh, allegiance to Al-Qaeda, but 10 different organizations, and what is our American foreign policy dealing with 10 different terrorist organizations in 10 or so different countries? So let's go through these with a high-level overview. In Egypt, we have the Muslim Brotherhood. They were overthrown uh, in 2013 under uh, President Morsi. He was uh, purged from office. He was uh, overthrown in a coup, uh, but we have um, a situation there of this still, the continued presence of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic State. This is a Sunni organization. And it's rather interesting to think that here's an organization creating chaos within areas of Syria and, and Iraq, and the funding is coming from private um, donors, private funding, from Saudi Arabia, one of our other strong allies in the area. So it's rather interesting that one of our allies is creating this regional instability that the United States and some of our allies have to deal with. They are active in Iraq and Syria, but also Libya, Nigeria, Niger, a couple of other countries, Chad and Cameroon. What's horrifying about this is they have been somewhat unstopped. Uh, we are only exercising our power against them through airstrikes, uh, and for the most part, <clears throat> they're no longer traveling in large groups, large motorcades or convoys, so it's harder and harder to target who they are and where they are. I'd also like to draw your attention to the last two bulleted items, ethnic cleansing of Christians and Shiites. I think all of us are somewhat aware of some of the horrifying decapitations there have been. It's a Salafi group. We're going to hear that word several more times in the remaining minutes that we've got together. Salafi is a strict interpretation of Islam, so again, the idea of creating an Islamic caliphate, not only in one or two countries, but across the entire area of Central, Eastern, Western Africa. Peace brigades, I'll just pause on this briefly. These are Shiite militias from Iran. It was interesting that when we invaded Iraq, you might remember the name Muqtada al-Sadr, he had mobilized the Mahdi army to fight the United States, and now we are uh, 
uh, in the process of trying to get his support, a former enemy, his support, to fight ISIS. Al-Nusra, an affiliate in Syria, uh, another uh, organization with some units uh, of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, Al-Sharia, Benghazi, these are the people responsible for the attack in Benghazi, the organization that has destabilized uh, Libya. Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab, you've heard about this through uh, Somalia and in Yemen, about seven to 9,000 people. One would think that it would be possible to mobilize some kind of an offense or defense to uh, kill, capture, or um, destabilize the 7,000 or 9,000. But right now, they are pretty much unstoppable. It's called the Party of Youth, another Salafi organization. Uh, Agap, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Salafism, again, is um, part of their philosophy, the strict interpretation. They're responsible for some of the additional franchises in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and you see the three uh, other terrorist uh, acts <clears throat> that they were involved with at the bottom of that screen. Boko Haram, Nigeria, another Salafist group, 7,000 to 9,000 people there. The Nigerian army has been incapable of confronting and destabilizing or overthrowing this group under the presidency of Goodluck Jonathan. That's one of the reasons why he was overthrown in a recent election. It'll be interesting to see what Buhari does to try to stabilize that Muslim region uh, of Northern Africa. But please take a look at the bottom of, these, of that particular screen. Over 10,000 people have been killed so far, 1.5 million displaced. Okay, um, that's the end of the material that I had wanted to share with you. I think what we'd like to do now is open this up to your questions or your comments. So, Bob, we have a question from um, Joe about the strategic interests of um, the United States. Can you share with us your thoughts on that? Uh, strategic interests. I think our focus right now is what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. There's a confrontation there. There's also a confrontation uh, with China, uh, with their, the economy of China, the devaluation of their currency, the impact that's having on the United States. They are also developing a very strong Navy that may have more ships in the Pacific Rim than the United States by 2020. Do we have the resources, Katie, to concentrate on what's going on at these 10 or 12, 13 spots in Africa? The answer is no. Under the Reagan administration, our military was structured to conduct two conventional wars. Under the Clinton administration, that was reduced down to one and a quarter. As you know, we're currently in Iraq, we're currently in Afghanistan, we are stretched too thin. What about um, some new breeding grounds for terrorism? Well, I think we've got enough going on uh, within the African continent. Uh, you saw the cluster of failed states. What I would fear now is people repatriating from Syria, from ISIS, from ISIL, and coming back to Canada, the United States. We've seen a number of people arrested we're trying to leave Minnesota and go to support ISIS. So I think the lone wolf terrorist, not the franchise terrorism, but the lone wolf becomes our next domestic threat. What does the security situation look like in South Africa? In South Africa? Um, I can't answer that. I don't have that information. Okay. I'll pass on that one. All right. You mentioned financial support for ISIS coming from Saudi Arabia, but do you mean from private sources and not directly from the Saudi government? Uh, primarily from private sources. What strategic concerns do we have in West Africa? Are we working to stabilize those countries? Uh, the United States is working primarily behind the screens on that, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we're leaving that to ECOMAS and ECOMOG through Nigeria. We don't have the capability of putting boots on the ground. Uh, there's some uh, humanitarian aid, but that's probably the extent of it. Okay. Christopher asks, can you explain uh, Shiite and Sunni, Sunni Muslims and ISIS and ISIL? 
Um, ISIS and ISIL are basically the same. Islamic State in um, Syria and the Islamic State in the Levant. The Levant is a term to describe the territory that stretches from Syria into um, um, Iraq, which is called the Levant area. The difficulty that we're having in trying to stabilize things in Iraq is the problem between the Shiites and the Sunnis. And that goes back literally hundreds of years, perhaps back to the 6th and 7th century. It has to do with who is the recognized true descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, it's not getting any better. If anything, it's getting worse. Uh, if I could draw your attention back to Saddam Hussein, when the United States threatened to declare war against Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein said, if you do, this will unleash the mother of all wars. And the United States thought that that meant the United States versus Iraq, and we could bomb them into submission. What has now been felt, uh, was the intent of that comment, is unleashing the civil war, the sectarian war between these two um, competing uh, sects. Okay, Michelle had a question about what types of strategies work, and she realizes that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to these situations, but are there things that work? Uh, Michelle, that's a really wonderful question. Um, I heard some presentations on National Public Radio, some presentations by some of our key people in the Armed Forces um, Committee. Right now, we have no tactics that we're using in some of these African countries, especially in Iraq and in Syria. And the question was raised, and I think it was by Senator McCain, when he said the absence of tactics does not constitute a strategy. And the only tactic that we're using is to try to use airstrikes against ISIS and ISIL. Other than that, as far as the training of Sunnis to fight with the Shiites, now that, sounds, that sounds good, and it looks good on paper. That means they first have to recruit Sunni um, fighters, uh, Sunni soldiers. As of last week, they had recruited 25. So I'm not sure that one's going to go anywhere at all. Okay. Mary Ann asked, um, she knows that this is a general question, but is it safe to travel to Africa for vacation? Any guidance? Um, <clears throat> I think that depends on where you're going. There are still some wonderful safari trips in Kenya. Some friends of ours are departing very shortly for something like that. Some of those areas are safe, um, and it depends on the tour guide. To do it on your own, I think it'd be a, an error in judgment. Okay. What role um, do Western powers, formal colonial powers, play in the emergence of those failed states in Africa? Um, excellent question. Um, there was an article recently in Time Magazine, perhaps maybe two months ago, called The Sins of Our Fathers, and it had to do with exactly the point that you're raising here. Uh, after World War I, uh, a number of European countries divided this former Ottoman Empire into a number of states, a number of states. Sometimes they're called tribes with flags. It was based on a tribal separation of certain countries. Um, and as far as the colonial powers leaving, I think it has left um, power vacuums and economic vacuums. I saw that happen in my year in Zambia. When the Brits finally left after independence in 1964, most of the key jobs, most of the key companies left with them, leaving an ill-trained economy. It's taken us 200 years, 215 years, to develop what we have in the United States. We're now expecting some of these failing states to to rise to first world standards uh, in about a five or 10 year period of time. Uh, if you wonder where socialism has worked, it probably has worked in some of these developing nations because capitalism clearly has not worked. Um, can NATO be blamed for Libya becoming a failed state? Um, to my knowledge, Libya is not part of NATO. Are you referring to the um, United Nations rather than NATO? Okay. Um, can you comment on Burkina Faso? And is the conflict in Mali affecting neighboring countries? Uh, Burkina Faso was in the news uh, not too long ago for an attempted coup. I think that was uh, suppressed. As far as the conflict in Mali and neighboring countries, 
Um, I, I don't have any current information on that, so I'll have to pass on that. Brett asks, will our decreased dependence on foreign oil be effective in reducing the power of these terrorist organizations? Um, my feeling on that, Brett, is no. Uh, um, there's the sufficient destabilization as one thing. The second thing is who's going to have the oil if we don't purchase it and we are becoming more independent, but who else will get it? And right now we're finding that ISIS has taken control, and I believe the primary spot is Ramadi, the oil refinery there, and they're using that to fund additional terrorist activities. I think that's pouring more gas on the fire. I think that's all the time we have for Q&A today. Um, additional questions can be emailed to RIT alum at rit.edu or tweeted to at RIT underscore alumni with the hashtag pound me RIT webinars. And we will direct your questions to Bob. Note that all participants will receive an email from us in the next few days with a link to today's webinar recording. Many thanks, Bob, for being our distinguished speaker today, and thank you to all of our listeners for joining us for today's webinar. The next installment of MIRIT will be on Monday, June 22nd, with Shell Kazanchi, Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Degree Programs at the Saunders College of Business. Shell will present on how to negotiate for higher salary and other rules of negotiation.